Good afternoon and welcome to another event here on Dream Bank Social Channels. My name is Andy Frisky. I am a senior dream curator at Dream Bank. Very excited to introduce the featured speaker today. But before we go ahead and do that, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to this event, especially those who this might be their first experience with Dream Bank. So a little bit about who we are and why we are here. Dream Bank is a free community resource that is put on by American Family Insurance. The reason why we exist is to help inspire people to pursue their dreams. And in large part, we do that through the events that we offer. So we have nine different distinct event series that range a bride, uh, a wide range of topics, anything ranging from uh, business related activities such as the event today. We also have career related events, family related activities. Uh, we even have a crafting series. We offer events in Spanish. So again, uh, trying to appeal to as many different dreamers as possible. If you're watching this on our Facebook page, go ahead and press that events tab. That'll give you a good concise list as to the upcoming events um, within the next month or so. Speaking of which, there's one thing I would really like to highlight, which is our third annual Dream Summit. So the Dream Summit is a two day uh, uh, event of motivational keynotes and inspirational workshops where uh, virtually you're able to virtually meet like-minded attendees and speakers and explore your dreams and how to achieve them. We have a really, really stellar lineup uh, ranging from uh, Tan France, Glennon Doyle, Drew and Jonathan Scott, the Scott brothers, uh, Chef Jeff Henderson, to name a few. So I will go ahead and put a link in the chat um, to show you um, the, the lineup and where you're able to register. It is free of charge. Um, so we would love it for you to check that out. But let me go ahead and hop over to our featured uh, presenter today, Emily Steinman. So Emily founded the first iteration of Buoyant Marketing, her business in 2017, initially offering extensive copywriting and content marketing and brand strategy services. At the same time, she was still operating her first business, a fused glass art e-commerce company. As demand for her conversion copywriting services increased, she had to make the tough decision to turn her glass art back into a hobby. In 2019, after receiving an overwhelmingly amount of requests and winning her oh-so-relatable battle with imposter syndrome, she began offering website and branding design services. Now, Emily is a sought-after educator on the top topic of web accessibility, which is what she's actually going to be talking to about today. Please help me welcome Emily Steinman. Emily, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and help everybody understand a little bit more about web accessibility. And specifically today, not just talking about web in general, like social media platforms and all the places that you could be, but really your website. I am obsessed with creating functional, accessible websites, and I'm really honored to be here today. Thanks, Andy. So one thing I want to do is do a little bit of housekeeping kind of fun stuff. Um, while you're hopping on here, I would love for you to get some paper, some colorful pens. I don't know if you can see behind. Oh, I can't point on screen. Uh, see behind me, I've got tons of colorful pens. Do what you've got to do to take some fun notes that you can come back to and feel really inspired. And of course, I'm going to have you leave comments um, periodically throughout this presentation. And let me know a few things. I need to know that you get what I'm saying and that this might resonate with you. Or maybe you've been there, you felt that. Um, so maybe the first thing I'll have you really do is let me know in those comments if you've ever run into a website accessibility problem before. We'll get into definitions later. But if you feel like you know what that's like, or you feel like you run into a website that just plain old doesn't work, um, let me know. I feel like we've kind of all been there. You know what I mean? So let's talk a little bit about, um, before I even start advancing slides and getting into the meat of everything, um, let's just talk about what web accessibility really is and where we're at. Like, where are we starting from today? So I'm not sure what brought you particularly to this workshop. I know we're talking about website accessibility, which is my nerdy hobby and passion but maybe you're running a business and you're finding that you're not converting people into clients or customers. Or maybe you have an organization that you operate and you're finding that you're not getting a ton of donations or support. Whatever that might be, we can kind of dig in and figure that out for you. You're really here in the right place today, or if you're watching the replay, go ahead and say that you're watching the replay. We like to know those details too. Um, if you want to learn why website accessibility is important, 
if you want to learn how to implement some of these things, like we're just going to go over the tip of the iceberg today, but it's going to be super simple. I pinky promise, and it's going to be really, really impactful for your website. And then it's also great that you're here today if you want to give all of your users, your website visitors, your blog readers, whatever it may be, a really stellar experience. So if you are obsessed with client experience like I am, this is for you, I promise. We're going to talk about four main topics today, just four. We could get into hours and hours and hours of website accessibility nerdiness, but that might be for another time. But today we'll talk about four main things. First one is how to adjust your color contrast so that it makes everything on your website properly perceivable by our eyeballs. Next one is how to add alternative text so that people that either have low or no vision and they use a screen reader, or if your media fails to load properly and you can't see the image, there's at least text behind it. We can see what that is. And then also how to create proper links and buttons and other interactive elements so that we have great consistency and people are really quick to book you. And then the next thing, the last one, is how to properly use special effects without freaking out your website visitors and making them physically ill. Yeah, that is a real thing. So at the very end, I will share my website accessibility audit checklist. I dare you to say that 10 times real fast. And it'll have all sorts of really great stuff on it. It's got a lot of the links that I'm going to mention in this presentation. And of course, plugins. And it's it's a really great way to just do a self audit to see how your website is actually performing. Um, I would love any advice for screenwriter, filmmakers, website. Cool. I work with tons of creatives. So this will all be really tailored for you, Emily. Nice name, by the way. Um, okay, so let's let's go into the house. Uh, let's get out of the housekeeping items and really dive in because I really value your time and appreciate you coming here today. Or if you're watching the replay, whatever that today means for you. So let's go ahead and get started. So like any good conversation, let's start with a story, okay? I am a proud millennial and I needed to find a dentist last year. I found one, uh, sorry to cut to the chase here, but when I was searching, I did what every good millennial does. You pull up Google, you uh, search for dentist near me, and then you, you start to do your ranking. You say, oh, obviously I want the best ranked dentist first, not the worst ranked. Um, user reviews are super important. And then of course I zoomed it on in because there's no way I'm driving 20 minutes to get to a dentist when there's like 50 of them within five miles of my house. So let's just, let's just say that this is my criteria of sorting, right? Then what I did was I just started going down the order. I had ranked, I had made it all good. And of course I didn't spend a ton of time on this, but I really wanted to go and find the best dentist for me, really close to my house. So it was super convenient. I picked the top one and clicked on their website link and instantly I was bombarded like I had just stepped out of 1998. There was music playing, don't know where it came from. There were pop-up like things all over the screen. And it was just like weird and overwhelming. So I just clicked out of it. I thought, I think maybe I'm on the wrong site. I wasn't sure. I just didn't give it a chance. On the next one that I opened, everything was like really, really hard to read. The text was really like gray and the background was white. I couldn't read it. And the text was itty bitty. And I thought, what am I going to do here? I can't even read the content. Do I like copy and paste the text into a Word document? Like, this makes no sense. So I was like, no, that's too much work. I, I'm just going to go to find another website. Third one was also a dead fun fact. I went onto their website and I could tell it was obviously a dentist's website, but the navigation links didn't work. So I wanted to look at their about page, figure out who the dentist was. Um, I wanted to figure out their services. Could they treat people uh, for the different things I was looking for, um, including kids, because I have kids. Um, and then like their contact form, like none of those links worked. It was so bizarre. I thought, isn't that like site 101? But for some reason, none of it worked. So I finally found a website that worked for me. Now granted, it wasn't great. It wasn't even like beautiful by any means, but it worked. And I think that really tells you how important it is that we have to really think about function of a website, not just the form, okay? 
Now, just imagine that this is, this is opposite here. So just imagine your dream client needs to book with somebody to solve their problem. And you are really their ideal person. You are like their ideal person to help them solve their problem. They're excited, honestly, to solve that problem and give somebody money, right? Wouldn't you want that to be you? You know, the thing is, maybe though, they have limited dexterity. Maybe they've got tendonitis like me. Like, I don't know if you can see my funny mouse, but that happens. So sometimes people have to actually, instead of using a mouse, they have to use a keyboard um, and hit tab to tab through things on a website. Or maybe even your visitors, your ideal client might be colorblind. It's pretty common. Um, so maybe they need a higher contrast between the text and um, the link text so that they can find the links on the page and easily book with you. Maybe your ideal client actually struggles with some sensory issues and you have no idea. And maybe they don't do really well with lots of animations. It could be extremely overwhelming for them to have all of those things going on. The thing that you need to ask yourself is, looking at the way that your website looks right now, would they be able to navigate your site, navigate your site comfortably and easily fill out that contact form or scheduling form to book with you? Or will they hit that escape button within 10 seconds or less and go right to your competitor if they search the way that I did? That's just a, that's a question, I think, rhetorical question, if, if you will. Um, think about that for a minute in your business when you're looking at your website. That's the perspective you need to look at is how easy am I making it for them to work with me? You don't want to make it hard, trust me. The truth of this entire presentation about this entire matter is most websites are actually really inaccessible and your inaccessible website is costing you money. Hard truth, but let's gather together. We've got this. Okay, so we haven't really met yet. Um, obviously, Andy did a great job of introducing me. I want to give some more fun facts. Um, I'm Emily. I'm the founder and CEO of Buoyant, of course, a branded web agency, and we focus on accessibility, functionality, and of course, really pretty websites, but form comes uh, after function in my world. I'm an exhausted mom of two daughters. I don't have time for my long hair anymore, so I cut it short. I'm an Enneagram 3, for what it's worth. I don't know if any of you are Enneagram fans, but I'm a 3, super high overachiever, and I'm married to a 9 who's like all peaceful and whatnot. Um, I'm the host of Becoming Buoyant. I have a podcast for entrepreneurs with health hurdles and other life challenges, and we discuss all sorts of those fun things. And I've spoken on stage in three countries on radio stations in two, two different languages. And then of course, on a dozen podcasts, I love sharing content and whatever I learn, I want to share it with others because I feel like sharing is caring and why don't we all try to grow together, right? Let's get back to some of that nerdy goodness because this is just what gives me so much life. Um, here's a little bit of a confession time. I've had an inaccessible website for years embarrassingly like try not to try not to notice if I break out in hives here from sharing this honest truth but it's it's real um I had been so focused on serving my clients really really well that I spent absolutely no time on my own website and I think that's pretty relatable let me know in the comments if you've ever had that cobbler's kid has no shoes kind of a scenario where you work so hard in your own business serving your clients that you kind of put your own stuff at the back burner. The sad reality though of all of this is that even though I doubled down on my Instagram efforts, I was like, oh yeah, okay, I need to, I need to get back into this. I need to focus, get my get my stuff going again. I I hired a marketing assistant to help me with content marketing, editing my podcast, doing Instagram, all of these cool things for lead generation my website is not primed to convert. So let, let me just rephrase that a little bit here. So even though I worked really hard on social media, blogging, podcasting, starting a YouTube channel, all of these really amazing things, like super worthwhile things to do, I would send them all back to my website. Every link that I would have would point back to my website 
And my website was terrible. <laughs> it really didn't help them at all. And it gave a bad experience. So even when my dream clients were like primed and ready to book with me, my website was inaccessible and didn't really help them out at all. So even if you're putting a ton of effort into lead generation and content creation, all of that good stuff, you might actually be losing potential customers, those dream clients, without even realizing it. One way you might be able to tell is if your bounce rate is higher than it should be for your industry. Now, everybody's industry is a little bit different. Um, if you're trying to, um, it, you know, it, oh, sorry, <laughs> got a dry throat there. Your website bounce rate might be a little bit higher than it should be for your industry because people are clicking out faster because your website content might be inaccessible. So if your dream clients are trying to book with you and can't, you might be dealing with this and you might never really know because they're not going to come back and tell you that this was a problem. So I hate to tell you all of this. It feels like such a downer, but I want to give you that there's that there's some hope though too. If it's really any comfort for you, you're not the only one going through it. Obviously, I just told you my super embarrassing story and I'm fighting the hives right now because I'm like an Enneagram 3 that is super embarrassed to show you my flaws. But most websites, including ones owned by massive corporations, trust me, I've looked, I have this exact same problem. Truly, truly. I'll give you some nerdy stats if that's your if that's your taste uh, in a couple minutes. Even if someone's brand and website looks absolutely stunning on the surface, it doesn't mean that it's functional and accessible for all of their users. If your website gives people a really difficult experience from the start, they might actually assume that the rest of your services and experience are also very difficult. So this impression right from the right from the beginning is exactly what they're going to translate into the rest of the experience. If if you felt that way, if you felt like, oh gosh, this website is awful, this first impression is really terrible, would you assume that the rest of the services are terrible? You might, and they might be doing that too. So let's fix that. The big problem here is our websites are not compliant. There are actual rules here surrounding websites, and I don't want to get into all of the details. We're not here for a legal lecture by any means. I want to make it as simple as possible, but essentially there is something called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG 2.0. 2.1 is, is in works. Um, and it was set as a gold standard for what websites need to look and function like in order for them to be accessible and you know, functional for all people online. Here's where the cool stats come in. I love this stuff, so follow along with me if you, if you enjoy the stats too. According to WebAIM, who is a web initiative, or web accessibility initiative out of Utah State University, across the one million websites that they had analyzed, they literally went through and analyzed a million websites. They noticed that 98.1% of them had um, errors on their homepage, 90%. So when I tell you you're not alone, if you feel like your website's not quite up to par, almost 100% of websites are kind of miserable. So think about this. There's there's some more coming here. If your brain gerbils are already moving, trust me, there are, there are some fun ideas here. Okay, a few more stats. So one in every 14 homepage elements, that'd be like text blocks or um, photos or buttons had errors. And then any of the interior pages, like your about page, services page, you know, blog, uh, contact page, the basics, um, they 5% of them had accessibility errors. I mean, that doesn't, or one in every 20 elements, not 5% of pages, sorry, one in every 20 elements. So all of these little building blocks that make up your site, one in every 20 of them was wrong, was a problem. So that's kind of a lot, actually, if you think about it. Here's Here's the reality. I know a lot of you that are running a business, especially if you're a small business, you're a solopreneur, or maybe you have an itty bitty little team, you might have actually created your website yourself. You might have created your brand yourself and all of that is amazing. You wear so many hats and I can imagine you're here 
watching this dream bank presentation because you do have a huge dream of making something a reality and you really want to bring life into that dream. You want to serve people in a really big way. But what that sometimes means is everything is on your shoulders. And then you come to a presentation like this and you're, oh my gosh, you're doing everything wrong. Everything you know and everything you've done is not right. But what I want to say is that I think we forget to celebrate all of the work that we have done and all of the things that are going right. I think it is worthwhile to celebrate you for everything that you have done to this point in your business and all of those strides you've made. Made. I mean, just think about it. The fact that you came to this presentation today to learn about web accessibility is a huge, huge step for any sort of client experiment or experience. So I want to congratulate you for that big effort. And to be honest, I think what you're going to learn today, you're going to realize it is not that hard to make some really small changes and have a really big impact. So if you, if you feel like you're doing so much and you're really super overwhelmed, we can talk through that. And you can always feel free to look at my, my name and email at the bottom there and connect with me. Um, I'll be your cheerleader through all of this. It's really fun for me to talk through accessibility and um, you can have a cheer squad in me. So let's talk about how website accessibility affects more people than you realize. It affects everyone. Quite literally, every single person you know is affected by the lack of accessibility, or if you put an effort into it, accessibility. You may have been told to believe, or you may have thought that accessibility really only dealt with physical spaces, like maybe a parking stall, um, or maybe the width of a doorway, or that kind of stuff, or a, a stall in the bathroom. Those are for physical spaces, but what about our online spaces as well? This does exist, and obviously we have some guidelines for that. So let's talk about who is really affected when it comes to inaccessible websites. I would say people with no or low vision, that can include people with tunnel vision or spotty vision, color blindness, or in my case, I get migraines with auras. It makes things really awful sometimes. It makes it hard to look at a screen. And yes, I'm a brand and web designer. I'm on screens all the time. Then there are other groups too. People who identify as deaf or hard of hearing, people with limited dexterity um, in their hands. It could be even people that, this is just a permanent, or not a permanent, but a, a temporary injury. Maybe they broke their hand and now they have no right hand. They can't use a mouse. So now they have to rely on their left hand. It's really awkward. So maybe they're using a keyboard instead of a mouse. It's stuff like this happens a lot. Um, you could also have people with sensory processing disorders or um, cognitive disabilities. You can have people with mental health challenges a lot of people. You may know and greatly admire some of the people that would fall into these categories. And of course, you may yourself fall on this list as well. I sure do. The good news is that it's not actually hard at all to make some of these changes. You don't have to burn your entire site to the ground, I promise, unless if you want to. That's okay if you want to. I get it. I've been there. <laughs> but you don't have to if you don't want to. Let's just talk about the first steps here. The goal is not to create a perfect website because in my world and in my opinion, perfect does not actually exist. You can achieve greatness, but never perfection. I want you to have a website that looks good, feels good, interact, you know, the interaction is great and it's accessible for people of all abilities, even if it takes a little bit of time and effort to make some of these improvements. If you take everything you learned from me today in these four different categories, you would be able to serve an underserved and often ignored segment of your local market or online market if you're an online service provider, and you could really skyrocket above your competition. Let's like like let's actually sink this in here. There are people who leave websites all the time because they're not accessible, and if you're that dentist number four that I went to, your website was accessible. I'm going to go to you. Your, your ranking on Google now does not matter as much if your website is accessible. So let me know in the comments if you're ready to stand out in an actually a good way like this. If you are ready to make your website more accessible and just a way better client experience. 
let's floor them with accessibility. Let's talk about a recent client example. This is just a this is just a standard website that I think anybody can relate to. It's a photography duo. Um, this is their a screenshot of their former homepage before we redesigned it. They have lots of beautiful photos, but there was no alternative text on 35 photos. They had low contrast errors on 31 different elements, meaning the text was not readable against something else. And then also the text size. They had some spots where the text was so itty bitty, you couldn't read it. Not sure what that was about, but that's okay. I fixed it. We did an entire brand and a website and color palette overhaul. Everything was completely different and it's amazing. Okay, yes, I had to do that. I had to sing because I'm so proud of it. As of their launch, all of their gorgeous photos, every single photo on their website. As photographers, they have thousands of photos. I went through and added alternative text to every single one of their photos, and it's amazing. And because of how I designed their new brand and chose their colors very intentionally, they will never have low contrast errors, and every single one of their text bits will shine against the background without it being too overstimulating. And then, of course, they don't have any miscellaneous errors, like too small, because I know that there are certain things that you should be doing. Like, if you make a website, try to keep it at 16-point font for body text. There are certain rules like this that are just really helpful. If you want to go to their website, it's abbyandbrandon.com. You can see their new site is more accessible and beautiful. Um, that's not why you're here today. Something that you want to remember, um, here's the thing. Sometimes we can have these self-talk these self -talk doubts in our mind of like, this isn't gonna work for me because I, I don't have time, I don't have skills. Um, and whenever you talk about websites, Emily, I'm afraid you're gonna talk about coding. I promise there's no coding involved, okay? No coding, this is so simple. Some of these things are, they're easier than even writing an Instagram caption, I promise. So I know sometimes we can have these feelings of like, eek, this is scary. I'm, I'm panicking. You're, you're going to give me a whole list of things to do. But I want you to know how important it is when your website's inaccessible and it's costing you money, maybe because of lost clients, that's a big issue. And I think the role of a business owner is to make sure that you're preventing financial loss, right? So let's let's kind of reel in that importance and say, no, I, I think this is important to do and we can do this. So I'll just teach you some of those basic principles so we can make changes over time. You don't have to do everything overnight. Now, granted, if you want to do everything very quickly, that's why people like me exist. So then we can help you and take that burden off of your shoulders. But for those of you who like to roll up your sleeves and DIY, I got you. This is why you're here and I'm going to teach you how to make this all happen and make some big changes really quickly. Okay, let's do this. I'm going to teach you how to do this, but I also need to know that you're ready to do this too. If you have a favorite emoji, I know Emily and Hannah, you are amazing in the comments. I'm so excited about your interaction. If you have a favorite excited emoji or like a heck yes emoji that's like the raising your hands or the confetti popper, whatever it may be, insert those into the comments because here we go. Okay, category one, fixing color contrast. Okay, in a world where form overtakes function, yeah, sometimes a lot of things are beautiful, but they don't work so well. Insert high heels, right? Um, we have to be really careful that the interactive page elements are clearly visible and usable for all people. Like this example of, have you ever read light gray or yellow text on a white background? It's as awful as looking at that Pantone chip with sunshine against the light gray. It's like, if you imagine if that was itty bitty text, it's impossible. Not even the cutest of blue light glasses are going to fix that. And of course this matters because you don't want anybody to work way too hard just to read the text on your site. Especially if you took a lot of time to write that text, right? So here's what you can do right now. Feel free to screenshot this because there's some numbers, ratios, and sometimes I don't remember this stuff um, if I don't take a screenshot. So here's your invitation to do so. Your body text and background should have a high enough contrast so people can perceive 
what the text is. So that should be a ratio of 4.5 to 1. Then the body text and link text, for example, if you wrote a sentence that had a phrase within it that was linked, but not the whole sentence, that the text colors and the link text colors should have a contrast ratio of 3.1 or 3 to 1. Sorry, not 3.1. And in the example that I have screenshot right here, you can see um, this is a tool that's really awesome. And you can check different, you can check the different contrast ratios. It'll give you a green pass or a red fail. It's a very academic of them at the university. Um, and then also icons and backgrounds. So social media icons, I know we all have them on our websites where at the bottom you can click on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever that may be, Twitter, if anybody uses that. And um, those should also have a three to one ratio. If you want to go to webaim.org forward slash resources, this is where this tool is. Otherwise, if you forget to jot that down, or if I move past the slide and you're like, wait, hold on, go back. Trust me, it's in my document that I'm gonna share at the end. Um, all of the resources are there, easy to click the links and get to it. So no worries, I got your back. Next one, alternative text. Okay, cool. So alternative text is that written content that lives behind the photo. Okay, not really but it's different. It's not a caption where it would live underneath it in really small text. That's a little bit different. That's where you can give a, a photo credit or something along those lines. Alternative text really is there to show what's happening in that graphic icon or photo. And we need to add this text to describe what's going on in that um, visual media in case of people that have low to no vision use a screen reader or in case of that media fails to load properly. That can happen. Sometimes we just have really, really terrible internet connection and we need to know, is that image something that we need to be paying attention to and maybe move to a better area where we have better reception? Or can we just kind of skip through because that's just a visual indicator of something and the text is more important. You can make a better decision when you have alt text. So it affects literally everybody. Alt text is helpful. So here's what you can do right now. Every single image, icon, graphic, everything you've got needs alt text and it's gotta be unique. Um, if it's decorative, like cute little confetti on your screen, yes, I've said confetti multiple times, I just love it. Um, or if you have like a swoosh or a swirl or some sort of decorative element, or maybe you have little arrows on your screen, like I have here, you don't have to describe those. They're just purely decorative and that's okay. The next piece is single bit, including if you're a photographer and you have thousands of photos. Yes, sorry, bad news. Um, every single bit has to be unique. So you can't just copy and paste and make it, um, you know, say like, Emily owns Boyant Marketing and she offers blah, blah, blah services. Like you can't just copy that same thing over and over and put it into every photo because it doesn't really serve the purpose that it's there for. And search engines actually say, <laughs> we know what you're about to do. No. And they ding you points. So let's just not do it. <laughs> let's just be kind of conscientious and just go through and add alternative text, unique. Keep it simple. Keyword stuffing. Okay, this is the part that if you've ever went to a search engine optimization class or had a consultant, they may inadvertently tell you to add keywords to this area. That's not what it's for. Don't do it. Google will know. And that's kind of like what I was alluding to in the last point. And then the next pieces, these are actually just to make it easier for you. You don't have to add image of or picture of whatever, because screen readers actually can read that off and say, this is the type of media. And here's what it says for the alt text. And keep it concise. You don't have to write a novel for every picture. Just describe something really simple and you know, keep it really um, to outline the mood or whatever you're trying to showcase. So for me, in this particular screenshot example, I have Emily is wearing a white button down shirt and a turquoise necklace. She is working at her cafe and is looking at her phone. Funny enough, I was about to wear this outfit today and I realized that would be pretty weird. Um, so I decided to change. <laughs> <laughs> okay, step number three, let's create some proper links and buttons. And what I mean by that is just be really consistent. I guess that's the that's the best part about it. Just keep things consistent, right? 
Links are typically for page navigation. Uh, like think of like the traditional underlined links. That's for page navigation. Buttons that are typically, you know, with a, a box or a bubble and then text on top of it, those are typically for things that you fill out, like submitting forms, contact forms, newsletter forms, maybe a scheduling tool. That's typically what a button is for. However, this rule is becoming broken more and more and more these days. So if you like using buttons everywhere to go from page to page to page in your website, and you do that consistently, have at it. People will understand with your brand how you're portraying it. As long as you're consistent with that usage, that's going to be okay. Now, following these rules will actually allow your users to really understand that look and feel of your page and your brand and brand consistency is so key if all of your pages on your website look like one thing and then you have a couple one-off pages that don't really look the same way they don't behave the same way it uh it's going to throw people off they're going to click out because they're going to think that they went to the wrong site so that's a that's a higher bounce rate situation and you don't want that you want to be so easy for your prospective clients to work with you, right? Right? Yeah. So here's what you can do right now for proper links. If you can see my little, my adorable little animation here, um, learn more about our design services, I hover over it and it underlines and changes colors. This is actually on my website. This is a, an example of it. So one thing that you can do on your website is use the same terminology. I mean, I'm really here about keeping it simple. So if you use the word contact in your header navigation, like your main menu, then use contact in your footer menu. You shouldn't use like the word support in one place and contact in another because people are going to find it to be confusing. So just keep it super simple. And if you want to be creative, you can add some like cute copy, some words next to it or near it but keep the links all really super consistent so people really get what they're looking for and it's like a no brainer. Okay, the next one is remove that ambiguity. If you use click here for all of your links, think about this. Let's close our eyes for just a, a quick second and imagine if you are using a screen reader, which is of course I've mentioned a couple of times, it's a tool that will read the content out loud to people so they can work through that website in an auditory way. Um, imagine tabbing through from link to link to link, just skipping some of the body text because you're really just trying to navigate. Imagine going through and then you hear, click here, click here, click here, click here. Without any context, that's pretty awful. You really have no idea what you're going for. So it doesn't help anybody at all. It just says click here, it's very ambiguous. So the way that you would actually fix this is use action-oriented phrases like log in or contact us or learn more about our design services. It's really okay to have more than just a couple words, especially when it's something that's going to help somebody understand the context of what that link is all about. The next one is using two forms of ID. I think, I think of the DMV, and I'm sorry if this brings back any um, terrible memories for anybody, but um, you know, having two forms of identification. So of course, before we talked about color contrast and making sure that the link text is a different color than the body text. But here's another one in my little um, graphic here that I have. Learn more about our design services also has an underline. You can choose to make it fit a little bit more with your brand if underline doesn't work well with your brand, maybe you can do bold or italicize it, or you can space the letters out. If you if you work in a platform that gives you a lot of creativity, um, you know, room for creativity, then you can go ahead and make it, find a movement oriented way to identify a link, not just by color alone. And then here's the last big one. Now, I mentioned very early on that it's possible to actually make your people sick. And it's true. This is something that I've studied a little bit and I feel like my entire world makes more sense. Just like how oh, nobody likes random music playing from a tab and they can't figure out where it's coming from. I mean, we all know what that feels like, right? Um, people can also get physically 
ill. Like think motion sickness from a roller coaster type physically ill when a website surprises them with too many animations or too many movements of transitions. It's really important, obviously, because if you want to bring people in and give them a great experience, you don't want to make them sick. Like you don't want to send them straight to a trash can, right? So let's talk about how to work with this. I'm a designer and I love making things really creative. I don't like being boxed in by certain um, rules, but at the same time, I really think that great client experience is more important than being the most creative person in the room, right? So we have to keep that in mind. Here's the one I struggle with in this entire presentation the most. It is the limiting automatic movements, um, including parallax scrolling. For those of you who don't know what parallax scrolling is, it's where when you're scrolling on the website and everything looks pretty flat, except in one little section, which I typically will call a canvas, one section, it's like the photo is behind and all of the foreground stuff is on top of it. And the foreground stuff scrolls, but the background image does not. So if that makes sense to you, you'll get why I say this is so hard to get rid of because it's really popular. A lot of people love the look and feel of this. If you want to play by the rules, play by the books, be completely compliant, you should just get rid of parallax scrolling. Now, I love it and I am of the theory as I get taller in my desk, um, I have the theory that people will scroll at a rate that is fast, as fast or as slow as they want. So parallax scrolling can't, it won't be super bad for most people. Okay, so we have to think about that a little bit. It's not gonna be as bad as you think. Um, but one thing that can be bad is if you don't give people options to stop videos that are autoplaying, or other things that are really fast moving. So parallax scrolling can be kind of slow and at your own pace. They can scroll with it, they can skip over it pretty easy. Um, but like if you have a, a gallery that is a, on a carousel, it just keeps moving, moving, moving like slideshow, um, that can be really distracting for people and very difficult for people. Or if you have animated GIFs, GIFs we won't get into that conversation. Um, all of these things are just, automated, if they last more than a couple seconds in animation, you need to have a way to pause them. That's just the rule of thumb. So videos should have a pause button um, or a play button. If that works better for you, then they get a chance to opt in and say that they want to watch that video that's going to play. At least have a pause button. And then of course, less is more. When it comes to a special effect, especially something that bounces in or blinks in or drops in whatever it may be, spins in, I don't know. We're talking about PowerPoint transitions a little bit here, um, but it happens on websites too. If you want some of these cool special effects to really emphasize a call to action, you can just do it really minimally because then it highlights that call to action much better and then it's not gonna get your people sick. So it's a win-win. Of course, one last, tiny little note is if you do include videos, um, I highly recommend using a software um, or like YouTube or Vimeo where you have the option to caption um, because captioning videos is obviously a huge need and I highly recommend that if you are embedding videos onto your site. Also, I highly recommend including a PDF where people can click to download a full written transcript. So a little side bonus content for you that's not actually in the presentation. Okay, let's just recap the things we've learned. Some of these things were super simple, just takes maybe a little bit of time to get through some of them. So things that you can do to really make a huge impact on your website would be increase the color contrast, add alternative text to images and graphics, use proper links and buttons, and then reducing excess motion. Not too bad. If you're feeling really ready to improve your accessibility and increase your bottom line, I have this for you. It's my website accessibility audit checklist. You can go to buoyantmarketing.com forward slash dream hyphen bank. Should have just done it all in one word, of course, but I didn't. And this is where I have, I mean, it's 
it's long. So prepare your printer, order some extra ink if needed, or just keep the digital version, that's cool too. Um, but I've got some areas where you can fill in and really ask yourself, well, it's like going through a guide and asking yourself some questions about what, do I have the correct headings? Do I have things notated properly? Do I have alternative text on all the photos? And it's like a, a really nice checklist um, that you can go through and do a self-assessment. If you are really brave and you're not afraid of getting feedback from others, I would actually recommend having someone else look at your website with this guide and having them give you feedback too. Because you might actually be a little harder than your, on yourself than you would realize. I know, it seems kind of weird, like you're going to pick it apart in a way that they won't. But at least if you give it to a few people and they're going to see it for what it's worth, and if they're, if they're people that you know are going to be super honest with you, then you can see where some of those faults are and where they're confused. They might look at some of your words or some of your photos and think, what's that doing there? And you know what? This is all just a way to improve your client experience. So it's all well worth it. So of course, yes, go to boyatmarketing.com forward slash dream hyphen bank. Um, and, and naturally, if you don't have the capacity because you're wearing 5,000 hats and you can't like do any of this stuff on your own, um, that's fine. You can just reach out to me. My contact information's here. And on the end slide, I'll show it again. Um, you can always reach out. I can help cheerlead you. I can walk through things. Or if you are ready to burn your brand and your website down to the ground and start fresh and make it really impactful, that's what I'm here for. I still have some spots for, um, for launching by the end of the year. So we can do that too. So I know this is a lot. Um, you might have a ton of notes that you scribble and I'm hoping that you color code them like I typically like to do. Um, and I'm really grateful you've taken the time to invest in not only your own business, but the experience of the people coming to visit your, your online home. I really know that some of this seems intense, but I know that some of you might actually use assistive technology and don't realize it. Like captions, like I had mentioned before, some of you might actually turn captions on because it makes it easier for you to watch a movie or pay attention to a video. Or maybe you use a keyboard function like, you know, control alt delete kind of a thing. Um, you might use these functions and not realize that you're using assistive technology. And you might not realize how important they've been for your entire life, if you think about it. Ultimately, user experience in general just includes um, accessibility for all people. And if you take only one thing from this presentation away, I just really want you to remember that an inaccessible website can cost you some money. So let's try to let's try to keep things from falling away from us and Let's try to embrace our customers and give them the best experience possible. So here, once again, is my information. Feel free to screenshot this now. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a, in a second or two here. And then we'll go to questions. So if you have any, um, let me know. I'm really excited to, excited to answer. It looks like we're on Facebook and YouTube and a couple different channels. So if you've got any questions, let me know. And if you, of course, if you're watching the replay too, um, feel free to email me. This is always fine. I have um, my Instagram at buoyant.marketing. Buoyantmarketing.com is my website. And then Emily at buoyantmarketing.com is my email. Naturally, I did not get creative with that. Just keep it, keep it simple is my logic. So, okay, I'm going to close the screen here and then let's chat about questions you may have. Thank you so much for that, Emily. As a uh... Um, people are typing any questions they may have. Again, I want to uh, thank you all for tuning in today to this presentation. Thank you, Emily, for putting that together. Definitely uh, some good nuggets in there, uh, things to take away that um, I hadn't really, really considered uh, before. So I, I very much appreciate that. Um, while people are typing those comments uh, and questions that they may have, I, again, I wanted to, to uh, highlight the, the upcoming Dream Summit that we have uh, next week, October 6th and 7th. I went and put the link um, in the comment there, in the comments there for you well, or for you as well. So anybody who's again watching this after the fact, um, they will have access to that as well. Um, while I am doing that, though, I'm going to go ahead and Emily put your email in the uh, the comments too, just uh, for ease of access. Perfect. For, Thank you for anyone who may be doing this after the fact. 
happens here. Oh, the Dream Summit's going to be incredible. I cannot, I, I can't even believe that. That's like, you've got so many amazing names and people that are just so inspiring. It's going to be, it, it's going to be amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of, uh, it's all kind of an all hands on deck event and we are very, very mm -hmm. much uh, excited for that uh, this year. All right. Got the email in there as well, too. We'll give a few more uh, uh, moments here um, as well in case anybody is is typing any comments. Um, if you thought that this presentation was of value um, and you think there might be a, a few other people uh, in your network that that would uh, get, get some uh, some insight for that, please go ahead and, and pass this along as well. This is a, a very yeah. important topic and something that we haven't uh, offered before at, at Dream Bank. Yeah, it's a really unique topic and I feel like it's it's really a no-brainer. We want to make sure that our clients are getting the best experience possible from us. And of course, we want to make sure that when we're working so hard on our content marketing, social media marketing, that those leads, then they can come back to our website and they can easily book with us. They can work with us. They can interact. I think um, they're really having that great experience and, con and continuing that through their entire client journey is just going to be... Um, honestly, better spent marketing dollars than you realize because client experience is going to lead to referrals. It leads to brand evangelists, people who are obsessed with working with you. Right now, most of my current clients are actually also previous clients. They just keep coming back to me because they're growing and growing. And, you know, I, I like to see that happen. I don't get sick of my clients. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it, it looks like uh, there aren't any questions coming in, so we will go ahead and cap it there. Again, Emily, I want to thank Sounds you. Good. Thank you all for tuning in today, and we will see you all next time. Sounds good. Thanks so much.